There was good reason why the cultures, cities and peoples who lived along the Silk Roads developed and advanced. As they traded and exchanged ideas, they learned and borrowed from each other, simulating further advances in philosophy, the sciences, language and religion. Progress was essential as one of the rulers of the Kingdom of Zhao in northeastern China at one extremity of Asia more than 2,000 years ago knew all too well. A talent for following the ways of yesterday, declared King Wu Ling in 307 BC, is not sufficient to improve the world of today. Leaders in the past understood how important it was to keep up with the times. The rise of Europe sparked a fierce battle for power and for control of the past. As rivals squared up to each other, history was reshaped to emphasize the events, themes and ideas that could be used in the ideological clashes that raged alongside the struggle for resources and for command of the sea lanes. Busts were made of leaning politicians and generals wearing togas to make them look like Roman heroes of the past. Magnificent new buildings were constructed in grand classical style that appropriated the glories of the ancient world as their own direct antecedents. History was twisted and manipulated to create an insistent narrative where the rise of the West was not only natural and inevitable, but a continuation of what had gone before. I came across this book uh, by Hazard, about to watch a movie, and I just had some, some moments to spare, and then I saw some books on sale, and I saw this uh, uh, Silk Roads in Chinese. I was like, oh, that's interesting, because we're going to talk a lot about the One Belt, One Road, so I'm looking for books like that, and it turned out to be really fascinating. Do you think it's a, it would be difficult for people to, I mean, uh, for people not from the academia to read mm -hmm. it. Don't mistake me as some kind of academia or scholar. I, I'm absolutely not that kind. The moment I picked up this book, I started with the Chinese version, as I said, it was not difficult. It was just fascinating. Of course, there are many different names of places, names of old kings and queens and cities that might be a little bit difficult to remember. But the style, the style of the storytelling was really simple and really interesting. So it was very easy to read it. I noticed in the byline it says the new history. I suppose then people would guess it is opposed to a old history. So mm -hmm. what is the difference between the in the past, or normally when you talk about world history, you'll be looking at it from a Western perspective, from the European perspective. Uh, in his words, he said normally the world would be spinning uh, on the axis of Europe, the rise of Europe, whereas he is purely looking at things from the ups and downs of what what happened in the middle of Asia, from the Middle East to Central Asia to the western part of China. And for me, this is interesting because this is a new history of the world um, that we haven't seen before. And also, this is not from a Chinese perspective, because we also have the habit of uh, looking at the world from our perspective, right? So this is really a new perspective. I, I think that is also why this book has been selling so well, because it is something uh, totally new to a lot of people, uh, not just in China, but also in the Western world, to see the world not from the Western perspective, but from a Central Asian perspective. The distinction between the West sphere of the world and the East sphere, do you think that's an idea, maybe a little bit outdated? Well, I would like to think that it's an outdated idea that we should really be living in a world free of ideology. Unfortunately, um, a lot of people are not thinking that way, especially a lot of people in the Western media. That's why a lot of the reports we're seeing is, we say, biased or um, with a lot of prejudice. Um, ideally, I think what connects people really is more than what divides people. but. 
in, in the world that we're living today, we are at a disadvantage because of the kind of dominance of the Western way of thinking, the Western way of looking at the world. Um, I think eventually, ideally, if we are able to break down this barrier and look at things from a global perspective, but that has not been the reality, right? That I don't think that is very easy at this moment. A lot of people are not looking at it. If you look at the Western media, for instance, what's reported on CNN or BBC about what's happening in Syria is clearly a Western-centric uh, perspective. And what we read, what we talk about, what we, we report is to tell them, look, there is another perspective, the Chinese perspective, the Eastern perspective. And for the people in Syria, for instance, they have their perspective as well. Um, unfortunately, at this moment, all of these perspectives are very different. And I think in order to break down that barrier, it is really important to read things like this so that we understand each other better.